Hello and welcome to another day of walking with Jesus. Um, today what we're going to be looking at is sort of the moral and ethical codes and distinguishments uh, regarding Christianity and the teaching of Jesus and that of the law and the prophets. So often the saying goes that the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible is a covenant of law and that um, the New Testament is a covenant of grace. And therefore, in the Old Testament, the law um, is, you know, it, it provided the boundaries for life and what was acceptable and whether or not you were in or out of relationship with God. And then in the New Testament, with the grace of God, it doesn't matter what you do so much anymore, as long as you confess your sins. And in this passage today with Jesus, we're going to see, well, not so much. That's not exactly the truth. While some of the ceremonial laws and things of that nature that we are familiar with, with the Hebrew law code in Leviticus and the way to do the cultic sacrifices and purity rituals and eating rituals and things of that nature. While a lot of that has been set aside in the new covenant, the moral ethical standards of the law have actually been intensified or increased so that, as Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, that you've heard it said that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you that if a man looks on a woman lustfully, he has committed adultery in his heart already. And so there's an intensification there. It's no longer just what we do, but it's also what we think um, that matters to our God. And so as we come into the kingdom of God and into the grace of God, the moral and ethical standards that he set in place don't go away. And we need to remember to be faithful and true to those. And so that's kind of what this passage is going to be referring to. We're looking at Luke chapter 16, verses 16 to 18. And we have these um, right immediately following, you know, the, the God looks on the heart passage that we looked at yesterday. And he says, the law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Okay, so, so what we have here is we have the law and the prophets were until John. And that almost sounds like they passed away. They're no longer important. But that's not what he wants to say. Everything was ordered by the law and the prophets up till John. But with John, we have something new coming. We have the beginning of the good news of the kingdom of God. John preaches the good news of the coming of the kingdom of God. Jesus preaches the good news of the coming of the kingdom of God. And so up until John, then since John, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it, everyone has to um, make a decision. What are we going to do? We have to be intentional and involved in this decision-making process about how we're going to go forward. We're not just going to be born um, Jewish and that's, that's it. There's going to be a, a necessary involvement of our own will to enact on this and to be involved in this. Everyone forces their way into it. It's probably reaching back to the parable of the unjust steward who, was, who, who recognized that judgment day was coming and he needed to do something to get, get things squared away so that, so that he would have a way of living out the rest of his days. And so... Here we have everyone forces his way into it. Everyone has to take action and be involved in the, the pursuit of the kingdom of God. And 
for doing things. And then verse 17 modifies, you know, but the law and the prophets don't go away. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. So we can't just say the law is passe. It's not. The one dot of the law is like the the horn on a letter. It's the little flourish on a letter. It's, you know, it could be a breathing mark or an accent in our languages today. It's, it's the smallest stroke kind of a thing. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for any part of the law to become void. In other words, the law remains in terms of our moral and ethical behavior and how we operate in right relationship with God and with others. And then he throws this um, one example out, which has to do with divorce and marriage. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. And, and here, there's a lot of cultural things going on. And there's a lot of um, background that perhaps we would need that I don't, I don't really want to get into today. But the, the biblical idea here is not just simply if you get divorced and you remarry, you're committing adultery. This is everyone who divorces his wife with the intention of marrying another. In other words, I'm putting this old version that maybe has gotten a little rounded and not in as good a shape and not as pleasing, and I'm putting her aside in order to get married to a, a younger, better version or whatever. That doesn't happen in our society, certainly. But, but that, Jesus says, is adultery. It's the same as adultery because the intent of the heart is, is not about faithfulness and it's not honoring marriage. And so there was a social custom and constraint. A woman could not initiate a divorce in that society but she could make life miserable for the man she was married to so that he would want to divorce her. And so Jesus is saying this is, this is good both for the man and for the woman. That's why he goes both directions with this. And the idea is you're supposed to remain faithful to the one that you marry. That's the idea behind it. And the ethical standards are higher in the kingdom of God even than they were in Jewish society at the time. So not only does the law not disappear, not, not only does the moral ethical demand of the law not go away, it actually gets intensified. And that's what is going on here. So how about us today? When, when we think about we are saved by grace, not through works, we are kept by grace, not through works. I'm concerned, and I've, I've said this numerous times in, in numerous ways, I'm concerned that it's really easy for us to slide into a view of presuming upon the grace of God and saying, yeah, I can do whatever I want. I'm gonna, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what I do because the grace of God is sufficient. You know where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more, so it doesn't matter. Actually, yes, it does matter. We are being invited into the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are being invited into the presence of the Holy One. We are made children of the Most High God, and therefore our character and our conduct should align with the family values of the Kingdom of God. And what we do should reflect the heart of God. So I don't know where you are, and I'm certainly not here uh, to beat anybody up for where they find themselves in their lives. But here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about, am I striving with the fullness of my being to walk in harmony with the ethical, moral will of God? Not in order to be saved, I am saved through grace, but in order to be pleasing and acceptable to the God who loved me enough to die for me. Are you walking that way? There is no sin that excludes you from the kingdom of God except denying the work of the Holy Spirit in the person of Jesus Christ. But 
we shouldn't use that as an excuse to sin. We should desire to please God. Well, God bless you as you walk today with Jesus, striving to be pleasing and acceptable to him.